This week on the show, beefed up security in the city of love. I don't think there has been a time at which we felt unsafe. Birthday celebrations in the Basque country. Bilbao is beautiful, Bilbao is ready for the future. And how to stay in London for a tenner a night. Today we're in Paris. For decades, the French capital has been one of the most popular travel destinations in the world. The city tops many people's travel bucket list, and there's no shortage of reasons why people are drawn here. Paris, you, you have to. Is the tower? Is the the river? Everything, the architecture, the history. Romance, the atmosphere, the history, the culture. Oh, the food, the people, the culture, the arts. This, it just says. It's really not difficult to see why people fall in love with Paris. The city is spectacular and is crammed with iconic sites. But last year, the French capital saw a drop in visitor numbers of around one and a half million. The decline in numbers was mostly blamed on high-profile terror incidents, including Charlie Hebdo and the November 2015 attacks at the Bataclan and locations across the city. Visits from Italians fell by over a quarter in 2016, and a staggering 41% fewer Japanese tourists took trips last year, according to official statistics. And all this has had a real impact on the local economy, particularly for businesses in the areas near the attacks. I've come to meet Robin Grenier, manager of Lamy Pierre. His bistro is a short distance from La Belle Equipe, the restaurant where 19 diners were killed during the attack two years ago. So what happened here on the night of the attack? It was le 13 November. Vers 9h30, 10h, je ne sais plus exactement, j'ai un, un ami avec lequel je joue au rugby qui travaille dans la police et qui m'a téléphoné en me disant « Ferme, ferme, ferme ton établissement tout de suite, ferme, ferme, tire le rideau, c'est dangereux. » J'ai tout de suite fait ton, descendre mon rideau et j'ai gardé tous mes clients ici. Voilà. Et puis ça s'est dé, 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 décanté vers 4-5h du matin, tout le monde est rentré chez soi et le lendemain matin, donc on a découvert l'horreur de, de ce qui s'était passé. Being so close to the attacks has had a long-lasting impact on Robin's business. For you, was there a noticeable dip in tourist numbers? Je pense pas. Les, les, les touristes sont quasiment pas revenus. Alors, avant les événements, on était, je dirais, 60 d'habitués, de gens du quartier, des Parisiens, et puis 30, 40 comme ça de, de touristes. On avait fait, on, a, on était apparu dans une émission au Japon, et donc on avait tous les soirs un ou deux Japonais qui venaient. Et le jour, crac, des événements, il y avait des Japonais ici. Et le lundi, plus aucun Japonais. Et les Américains, c'est la même chose, a énormément changé. Donc on est passé à 90% de, de Parisiens et 10% des, de touristes étrangers. Voilà, en l'espace de quelques... Bah, d'une journée, pouf, comme ça. And have you changed anything about your business, your approach, since that time? Je suis plus attentif au bruit, aux gens qui rentrent. Je fais attention. Avant. avant, on était plus décontracté, et c'est vrai que ça a modifié notre comportement. Mais moi, dans mon travail, je ne veux pas changer ce que je suis. High-profile headlines about the city have led some tourists to take extreme measures to help them feel safe when visiting. I've come to the Triangle Door, one of the most exclusive areas in Paris, to meet George Foster. He's managing director of a company that offers personal bodyguard for clients in cities around the world. What kinds of people would you have on your client list? Um, that can range from royals, foreign royals, um, to high net worth individuals from the corporate business, and to music and uh, film stars. Do you ever get just your average Joe coming, wanting your services? It does happen. Uh, we're in a, a, a world today where terrorism is in the forefront of everyone's mind. 
So it is uh, it's something that people react to and then consequently they require our services. It's not a cheap service, but we are very competitive as a company within the sector. Um, and I think you very much get what you pay for. So why is it that your company has recently opened a new office in Paris? We were experiencing a high volume of um, inquiries and calls, um, all the way back to the Charlie Hebdo incident. But it's very much reactive as to, to what's happening in the media. Now, a personal bodyguard is clearly beyond most of our travel budgets. And of course, statistically, the chance of being involved in a security incident remains extremely low. But the city's putting in a huge effort to help make all tourists feel safe when visiting Paris. The mayor's office recently published a 59-point plan to lure back tourists. Paris wants to not only reverse falling numbers, its goal is to become officially the most visited city in the world. Paris is currently in third place behind Bangkok and London. As well as improvements, such as better lighting and cleaner streets, measures are also being put in place to improve security across the city. The most high-profile project is here at the iconic Eiffel Tower. Access to the bottom of the tower is currently restricted by these pretty ugly temporary barriers. But the city's just started construction on a series of 2.5 metre high glass walls to protect tourists. The walls will be bulletproof and will also stop vehicles from being able to drive onto the site. Other major cities are following suit, increasing security measures to protect tourists and key attractions. Following terror attacks earlier this year, temporary barriers were installed on bridges in London and the Spanish government promised to ramp up protection at main tourist areas in Barcelona. It really doesn't take long to spot an increased police presence here in Paris. So are these measures helping to reassure tourists about their safety in the city? I don't think there has been a time at which we felt unsafe. Um, and we've certainly seen the Green Berets. I, I do think it affects the way I see like uh, masses. So I try to avoid places where masses, but like I have to say like at least in the, city, in the uh, streets I've been, you see a lot of military, which kind of helps like calming down. It's always in the back of your mind, but as I walk, I feel a lot more comfortable. Alongside security improvements, millions of euros are being invested in tourism sites in the battle to become number one. Across the city, old attractions are being renovated and new ones opened. For instance, 60 million euros are being spent to transform the Jardin d'Acclimatation here into a state-of-the-art theme park. So far, the improvements in investment certainly seem to be working. Statistics for the first half of 2017 shows that Paris is on track to reverse the downward trend and welcome the highest number of tourists in 10 years. So will this be enough for Paris to take the title as most visited city in the world? You can bet Bangkok and London will be watching very closely. We're heading to the Middle East next, where this week's global gourmet is cooking up something spicy in Bahrain. My name is Bassam Al Alawi. I'm the chef and owner of Darsin Cafe at the Bahrain National Museum. Today I'm going to cook for you something that is dear to my heart. It's a local dish called Saluna, uh, a curry that is basically a distillation of all the cultures that have met through the different trade routes on the island. Saluna is usually made with uh, many things, but today we're focusing on seafood. And I've chosen hamour, a very local white fish that everybody loves and can be cooked in a variety of ways, different spices, different takes on it, but this is mine. Now I'm going to add the ghee or clarified butter into another pan to make the masala, which is our curry or salona base. So while the fish is being seared and the masala is cooking down, I'm just going to prepare our spice mix, which is just going to be put in with everything else. I'm just going to add some Bahraini masala, which is a local spice mix, a little bit of turmeric, some cumin, some Madras curry powder, another import that is a favorite in Bahrain. Just give that a quick mix. 
a little bit of ghee, some Kashmiri chili powder, a nice bright red. I'm adding the, mas the spice mix to the masala paste that we've been cooking off. I'm gonna pour some marrow stock into our jitter. It's a traditional Bahraini cooking pot used in a lot of the old Bahraini homes here. Fine masala base. Putting our white grouper. Locally known as hamur. There you have it, our local hamur saluna. Still to come on the travel show. Simon's back, having a look through his travel inbox. This time, how to stay in London for less. And can you take your own booze on a cruise? And where in northern Spain, as one of its best-known landmarks, celebrates its 20th birthday. I can't believe this. I don't think I've ever seen so many people all in one place. The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're headed. Welcome to the slice of the show that tackles your questions about travel. Coming up, a place to stay in London for less than £10 per person per night and the tricky business of bringing your own alcohol on board a cruise ship. First though, travel to the Chinese capital is becoming a little easier with Beijing joining Shanghai in offering a transit permit that allows visitors from certain countries to stay 144 hours so long as they meet the right conditions. You must fly in or arrive by train direct from a country outside China. Surprisingly, Hong Kong is allowed. You're not allowed to stray too far from the capital, though a stretch of the Great Wall is permitted. And you must depart by air or rail to a different country by midnight on the sixth day after the day you arrive. Next, Miss E needs to know. Where can I go in January that has decent weather and it's not too expensive? One country stands out, Tunisia, where you'll find winter sunshine, a deep and fascinating history and friendly, welcoming people. For two years from the terrorist attacks of 2015, this North African nation was on many countries' no-go lists. But the place where the Arab Spring began is now open for business once more. Base yourself at a resort such as Hammamet and use the excellent rail system to see Tunis and Carthage. You might want to explore the desert landscape, so consider signing up for a trip into the Sahara, as well as a visit to Kairouan, one of the holiest Islamic shrines. But check the latest advice before you book and travel. Next, from India, Vijay asks, I want to travel with family to London for a week to 10 days. Can you suggest an itinerary with a shoestring budget? Accommodation is the big problem. Central London is one of the world's more expensive places to find a hotel. But happily, at some hostels, a family of six can stay for less than £10 per person per night. That's around $80 all told. Try to stay close to a tube station so you can plug into the world's oldest underground railway to explore the capital with the benefit that up to four children under 11 can travel with a fair paying adult. London has some of the world's most family friendly museums and the best of them are free. Doug Warner is planning a cruise with P and O and wants to know... Can you take bottles of drink on board? If so, how much? Cruise lines make very good profits from selling alcohol on board and therefore many are reluctant to let you bring more than a single bottle of wine. Happily, some of them are more relaxed, including P&O cruises. The firm says we will generally allow a small, reasonable amount to be taken on board for you to enjoy in your cabin. So what constitutes a small, reasonable amount? Well, 
you try to take a case of wine on, you might encounter problems. P&O reserves the right to confiscate alcohol at the gangway. But picking up a bottle or two at ports of call is perfectly acceptable. You can even take wine into the restaurant and pay a corkage fee of £15, which can work out a good deal compared with onboard prices. Whether you're contemplating a trip to the nation next door or the ends of the earth, I'm here to help. So email your question to thetravelshow at bbc.co.uk and I'll do my very best to find you an answer. From me, Simon Calder, the Global Guru, bye for now and see you next time. To Spain next and Bilbao on its northern coast is celebrating something of an anniversary this year. 20 years ago, one controversial building appeared that would utterly change the town's fortunes forever. We sent Keith Wallace to the Basque country to see the birthday celebrations. It's been two decades since the Guggenheim Museum appeared in the Spanish port city of Bilbao. Its arrival kick-started the transformation of a declining industrial town into the home of big-name art and architecture, and people started coming in their hundreds of thousands every year. But first and foremost, they came for the Guggenheim. Built from titanium, limestone and glass, the building's supposed to look completely different from whichever angle you see it. So part of the reason the building looks so striking is that they've clad it in these 33,000 titanium sheets. Now, they're only half a millimetre thick, which creates this kind of rumpled organic effect. Now, they say it looks like fish scales, but it, it also looks like they've wrapped the building in tinfoil. It looks a bit like a round of massive sandwiches. Inside, the permanent collection now hosts works from artists like Andy Warhol, Jean-Michel Basquiat and Mark Rothko. Well, this is an adventure. I wasn't expecting this. Where are you taking me? But it's this giant installation, The Matter of Time, that's the favourite of the man who's run this place from the very beginning. It reflects very well the spirit of this museum. It's, uh, it's a work which was done specifically for the space, but it also gives you the possibility of experiencing time as you walk through them. Describe for me what it was like in 1997 when, when all this was opening. How were, you, how were you feeling? It was an exciting moment to see that uh, the, the museum was finally going to be open to the public and be, be visited. The port uh, was already leaving this space because they were expanding in the harbour. So this was mostly marginal space. It was not really an urban uh, area, but it was fairly close to the city center. And it was, it was a kind of uh, a scar in the middle of the city. So what would Bilbao be like if you sucked the Guggenheim out of it? Well, it's difficult to say. I think it would be a different city for sure. We know that it has made the city a more cosmopolitan, a more open city. Now Bilbao actually has two big landmarks and the other one tells a story about what this city used to be. This is the Puente de Vizcaya, Vizcaya Bridge. It was completed in 1893 and was the world's first transporter bridge, designed to use a hanging gondola to get you across the river. There's also a great view from the top. So it's considered the most important industrial monument in Spain, and it's UNESCO listed because of its beauty and functionality but from the top from this walkway you get a sense of so that's the port of Bilbao and that's the Bay of Biscay and in the old days the port used to run all the way down this bank side which is several miles long it was the biggest port in Spain it was big shakes in its day it's a very different Bilbao from what we've got today Marivy Puente worked in a factory in the pre-Guggenheim years. These days she runs free tours around places like the Old Quarter for no other reason than her love for her city. At least You're going to do this? You're going to do at, this? At least I'm hitting the frog. <laughs> and this is the game of the frog. It's a Basque thing. On its mouth. Uh, Don't spin it. Uh, uh, the last one. Oh. <laughs> so what did you make of the plans for the Guggenheim when you, when you first saw them all those years ago? Well, uh, we were told that the Guggenheim was going to drive the economy of this place. At that time, we couldn't understand what they meant by that, 
but we say, how is a museum going to drive the economy of a place? No way. So we were even, in fact, we were in demonstrations against the construction of the museum. Reality after 20 years is that the city is much better, we are happy, and yes, the museum put the name of Bilbao on the map. As a thank you to the people here, the museum's been putting on something of a show during its anniversary week. I can't believe this. I don't think I've ever seen so many people all in one place. I mean, it demonstrates how big a deal this has been here. They estimate around half a million people turned out over the four days, and in a city of 350,000, that's quite a few extra bodies. Come on, let's get settled. We've got okay. the best seats in the house. Okay. The show traces two decades of the town's history, from the end of its industry to its rebirth as a centre of creativity, and it features one of its most famous residents. Ah, the spider! The mama! The spider! So what does seeing that make you feel about Bilbao now? I'm very proud of my city and I think that uh, with this kind of shows is, is proving that the difficult times that we went through when all the factories were closed. Right now I can tell you that uh, Bilbao is beautiful, Bilbao is ready for the future, but it's not only the Guggenheim. Bilbao is much more than the Guggenheim, especially the people. Impressive stuff from Bilbao, where the Guggenheim is marking its 20th anniversary. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's show. But coming up next week... A hundred years since the United States entered World War I, Addy travels south of Washington, D.C., where he discovers the ghost fleet of the Potomac and the remains of the ships that helped win the war. It's pretty cool to be able to touch something that's a part of American history. I mean, this wreck is nearly 100 years old. These ships were involved in saving the world from totalitarianism. So do join us then if you can. And in the meantime, don't forget, you can keep up with us while we're out on the road in real time by signing up to our social media feeds. Details are on the screen now. But for now, from me, Crystal Arwood, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Paris, it's goodbye. Oh, 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 oh,